So uh, Fred Thompson from Loyalty One is going to moderate a panel, and I believe Fred is going to introduce our panelists. Off we go. Okay, very good. So, uh, you know, really today what we'd like to talk about, and we've got a lot of getting great comments on loyalty programs, the different tactics, the different areas. We wanted to dive a little bit into rewards and incentives here. Uh, it seems absolutely appropriate given the venue, I think. And so uh, just to introduce the panel members again, uh, Jeff Diskin, obviously global SVP of global consumer marketing with Hilton. And uh, he didn't mention in his presentation, but Jeff actually has responsibility for not just the Hilton Honors Program, but also for media and from promotions and basically the whole customer marketing life cycle. So obviously a good purview around the uh, topic of rewards and incentives. Uh, Joshua Cantor is here as well from uh, Caesars Entertainment. He's the vice president of the Total Rewards Program as well as uh, Revenue Acceleration. And so uh, Joshua basically is responsible for driving relationships for entertainment seekers and uh, really has responsibility across the whole Caesars Entertainment uh, banners as well as uh, global responsibility. And uh, to my left here is Peter Vogel. He's the CEO and uh, the co-founder of Plink, which for those who are not familiar with it is an online to offline rewards program which basically uh, drives uh, a lot of activity in the restaurants and shopping industries and basically rewards uh, uh, members for engaging in their favorite restaurants and stores offline. So thanks to everyone for kind of joining. This is the, uh, the perfect pre-cocktail conversation. Uh, love rewards and incentives. We've heard a lot about the emotional heart, but uh, obviously I think there's still absolutely a role for rewards and incentives within a customer loyalty strategy. So Jeff, since you just were kind of up there and presenting, maybe we'll put the first question to you, is you talked a lot about the environmental, a lot about the emotional components. What do you see the role of rewards and incentives as part of the value proposition? Well, I think that they are the table stakes, if I go up to the Vegas vernacular, right, in, in the context of it. So those are the parts that people expect. They expect if they consolidate their business with us that they're going to get something tangible back. But I don't think that those are the pieces that actually generate that emotional connection and loyalty to you. They provide a framework for people to want to give you their information, to share information about themselves, to learn what they like to do, whether what they like to gamble on or spend their money on and maybe even how they'd like to be rewarded for that. But ultimately, again, in our research, we found that all those things were, were important and valuable, but that didn't convert somebody to be you know, in that partnership, that fan, and maybe even you know, that dog that comes greets you, mm -hmm. you know, sort of unconditionally at the door. What did that was when they felt that they were welcomed and cared for by our team members or at each of those touch points in, in the, the context. So that was, those are the things that actually, I think, generate more of the loyalty. But you can't get there in many instances if you don't have the table stakes in place. Got it. Got it. Joshua, similar view from, uh, from Caesars, or is it a little different? Um, well, actually, I, I think watching Jeff's presentation, all the specifics are different, but all of the principles and all of the concepts are, are very much the same. So uh, we're not, we don't consider ourselves to be a hospitality company. We're an entertainment company, and we provide gaming experiences, but also uh, you know, shopping and shows and dining and golf and spas and everything else. Um, but I think, I, think uh, exa I agree. And when I speak with my team members or, or the company in general, I, I often talk about the difference between the transactional experience of loyalty and the emotional experience of loyalty. And we, as a company, have really oriented ourselves around um, finding the ways that, to interact with our customers that resonate most powerfully most powerfully with them as consumers of entertainment experiences. Uh, and, and back to your original question, um, I agree with what Jeff said, that, that you have to have kind of published benefits that attract the attention and, uh, and of, of potential members so that they're willing to sign up and give you the at-bat for future uh, interactions. Uh, but in our case, all the published benefits are maybe 10% of what we um, uh, provide to our customers, and we do that based on preferences that individuals uh, tell us about or exhibit, um, and then uh, based on the, the strength of the relationship that we develop over time. Got it, great. Now, Peter, you have a little bit of a unique perspective here, I mean, because your business model actually is a rewards platform that spans you know, multiple industries and multiple players. Uh, how do you see kind of the role of rewards? Are, are these two guys underselling it a little bit? Uh, no, and, and you know, we, we actually, uh, we've been moving away from describing ourselves really as a loyalty program because we're not looking to replace a company's loyalty program. We're, we're looking essentially to be a marketing channel to help drive them new customers. 
So for us, I mean, we almost describe it um, as, as a frequency marketing program, what we do. We're trying to drive someone to go into your restaurant or your store and make X, X amount of purchases and become a habitual customer. Uh, we can't make them be loyal to a brand. You know, it has to be the experience they have while they're there. So we, we really kind of view ourselves as, as, as that marketing channel that drives that business. Uh, and, then, and then we do give away points, which turn into rewards. So we actually now are giving away hotel points, airline miles, all kinds of gift cards. And for our, our members, th that's the emotional response for them. When, when, when they get an award and experience it, buy it, or go somewhere with the points they got from us, that's really more the emotional reward they get. Got it, got it. We heard a lot earlier in the day about the power of big data. And so I'm curious as to what kind of best practices you all have been using to get customer information to inform the use of rewards. So how are you taking this information and, and better targeting these rewards to customers? I don't, Jeff? Uh, carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I mean, I think there's, there will continue to be more and more sensitivity around how anybody has access to folks' data. So, I mean, obviously, the customers themselves share uh, with us data, and we take a very conservative view about what we do and how we use the data that's shared with us. Um, but we try to track, sort of, at the broadest level, the behavioral things that people are looking for to do. As it relates to the rewards, we did segmentation study work, so we really understand the motivations, why people stay with us, what they're looking for, what kind of experiences they want generally and in different segments. So we're able in that case to try and build some of those things that are available and let the customers choose for themselves. And then the things that are around really specifically delivering an experience, that has to be something that you know we make an offering and then they take advantage of. But I think that, just again, our perspective is that the data is a huge enabler, but the customers have to have trust in you, right? There's no relationship that you have with them if the trust bond is broken. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we continue to um, fight broadly in marketing circles is, you know, is the desire to just leap into something. You know, I can get the results and make a business case for a spam version of an email, or I can make a case for you know, really pushing something through a social media outlet and being able to show that I got people to do things. But is it sustainable? Is it authentic enough to really do, or do people actually get tired of that novelty and actually sort of say, you misused that opportunity and trust. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's a place that we have to actually be quite careful in. Got it. Joshua, what are some of your favorite listening posts for kind of consumers' perceptions about rewards and incentives? Are there, you know, obviously we've heard a lot about social media today. I think Donna was very articulate about how they used uh, Twitter as a listening post. But uh, what are some of the tools and cha you know, channels you're using to kind of better inform the rewards? Well, I, I mean, there's, there's such a... Uh, a broad range of, of available sources these days. Um, as a company, we, we tend to listen to individual, like our existing members. Uh, so there, there are a lot of data out there, you know, through uh, whether they're review sites or Twitter or, or Facebook um, or blog postings. So there are a lot of those things out there. And there are new tools that are uh, available that'll do semantic analysis. And then you can get to sentiment analysis of, the, of that data. And, and all of that's important. And I would sort of say that we're scratching the surface of what's possible there. I do agree with what Jeff was saying earlier, though, that there is uh, an implicit agreement between the customer and, and the company, and you've got to be extremely mindful of what customers consider to be usable and, and uh, versus what's private. And so what we, we're, uh, I think, um, walking that line carefully as well. Um, but we, we as a company, um, try to make sure that we're always, we've always got an open line of communication with our customers. Um, I think about 5% of people who stay in our properties fill out a very detailed and sort of a, it's a um, dynamically populated uh, uh, experiential uh, evaluation that tells us about the various parts of our offering that they experienced and what it is they loved about it and what it is that didn't work for them. And so uh, we try to carry on that dialogue in, an, in a one-to-one -one basis whenever possible. Got it, got it. Yeah, please. Yeah, I was just going to add in, we actually recently uh, started doing something kind of interesting in regards to, to the, the listening, is that we're, we're using Facebook now as kind of a community-sourced 
a customer service platform. So uh, we have a pretty active Facebook page, so people ask questions all the time, and we started noticing people answer each other's questions. So since we're a rewards currency-based program, it's relatively easy for us to encourage that. When we see that happening, we send a personal message out to that person saying, thank you so much for helping out and answering this question. We give them 100 plank points or something like that. And we found the more we do that, the more we encourage that, and the, the less busy our customer service people are. And the almost more authentic, I think, an answer a person feels they get from one of our own members and customers. So that's just something that we've, we've started using Facebook a little bit differently now. Yeah, no, it's great. In fact, I'm thinking back, you know, even five, ten years ago in, in retail, we were always very careful when we designed loyalty programs to make sure the behavior that we were rewarding had a direct economic benefit. And what we've seen, is, you know, rapidly change here over the last couple of years is that we realize that there is an economic value to engagement and that all the behaviors now that we start to understand, yeah, there is maybe a long-term value to that behavior. So it started off casually like, uh, give me your email address and, oh yeah, I can think of that as how I'm gonna use it. But now we realize that just engaging in the brand is an incredibly healthy long-term behavior. And so uh, we would start to focus and start to reward that both programmatically as well as you know, a little bit more surprise and delight under the radar. So. What other types of uh, non-transactional behaviors like that, or just engagement behaviors, are you you all rewarding? Uh, you know, kind of as you you approach your program. Let's say I can steer to you, Jeff. <laughs> well, um, I think that the, there's we have the great opportunity that we have people there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, you know, we we like to try and do things where we engage the staff personally with the team, uh, with the customers themselves. So whether that's managers, receptions, or diamond member feedback, so we'll just invite people for a drink or to just spend time with us, and it becomes a listening post as well, if you will. Um, so I think that's one that's kind of interesting. I, I can tell you that I, I've been so probably asking for somebody to pitch us on an idea here, but uh, one of the things that I love about travel is that people get to see the world and see all the different cultures, but one of the things that's always a misstep to me is that at, at this hotel, there's all these different folks from all these different places and there's not really been a way to really enable people to engage with people of like interest in the experience. Mm -hmm. And so I've always thought about it in the context like if there was, there's a game on tonight, who's going to win Arizona or San Francisco, mm -hmm. right? Or, or, you know, where's the hurricane going to kind of come on shore? Ways to actually create a little virtual community of the people in-house. And I, that's something I'm still anxious to do, but every time we try to do something like that, it comes out a lot like Match.com, <laughs> which is a little bit concerning given our particular, uh -huh. you know, hospitality and hotel room. So, so is that back to Brian's creepy? Yes, or? So, so we have to be kind of careful in that respect. But I mean, I do think, you know, the, the potential is sort of unlimited now. That's what's so fun for all of us. I think, but, you know, a separate track is, it's also the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Is there so, so many limitless opportunities is being able to focus and channel some of the, uh, your resources against the things that you think are gonna be impactful. Yeah, understood. Hey Joshua, you threw out a number before about 10% and I wasn't sure if that was referring to kind of what you're investing programmatically versus surprise and delight, but I'm curious if you could follow up on that, uh, one as a benchmark and then two, maybe share a little bit of the approach of how you're thinking about surprise and delight rewards versus the program itself. Yeah, I think uh, our industry is a, is a little bit different from, uh, well, certainly the ones I had seen when I was a consultant, uh, and I, I did work in hospitality as well. Um, it was, it, I think I was following up on the point that, that Jeff had made that, you know, you got to, there's the, the price of entry to, to be um, at parity. You've got to have a certain level of interest uh, or interesting um, uh, offerings on the table when uh, somebody, you're asking somebody to sign up. Um, we as an industry tend to tailor our communications to our customers um, based on a combination of things. Uh, the offers they respond to, um, the uh, things that they, they look at on our website, the things that they tell us. We also have a high touch overlay. We have casino hosts uh, that will get to know our better players uh, personally and they'll you know, call for your uh, spouse's birthday and I mean things like that and invite you to have dinner on them. So we have, uh, we're, we're trying to cultivate meaningful relationships and back to the the numbers part of it um, I'm not sure that 10 percent is is a precise number but um, but we we do try to make sure that we augment the the, the points part of the rewards uh, with more experiential uh, things and and offers that are tailored to the individual so 
Uh, unlike most of the other businesses I ever consulted to, our customers in a, in a normal month will get between five and a dozen concurrent offers and maybe as many communications. So it's a very different uh, dynamic that we have in terms of being, having an ongoing dialogue with the customer and you've got to be able to listen and, and pay attention to what customers are, are telling you they like. And then you, you know, you've got to also uh, look to innovate. So that's mm -hmm. a bit more about what I was getting at. Yeah, no, perfect. Um, Peter, just had a quick question. You know, obviously you've got a wide purview across the industries. Are there certain types of rewards and incentives you're finding are becoming more effective and others that you used to do, they're just are sort of waning in their effect, eff efficacy? Uh, in, in regard to the specific Offer types, types of rewards? Uh, yeah, yeah, either types of rewards or timing of rewards sure. or perhaps, yeah. Uh, so on two slightly different fronts, I would say the types of offers that are getting pretty popular and pretty hot are a lot of these registered card type offers. I mean, you're seeing American Express launch their Link Like Love program at Facebook, which has been got a million and a half likes, I think, in the first month. The Bank of America just is doing a deal with Cardlytics. Um, Plink is essentially a similar model. Our members are registering a, a card with us, and then they have access to all the offers on our site. So I think consumers are getting more and more, uh, and it's interesting, Jeff, you used the word entitled. Like, we actually describe it kind of as a culture of entitlement where consumers are expecting these rewards now, I think. Mm -hmm. They're expecting to get something almost every time they do something. So I think those rewards tied to something you're already doing or to a credit card are pretty popular now. Uh, in, in, in regard to rewards, I mean, we still see for us, the most popular rewards are, without much surprise, are gift cards to places like Walmart and Target and Amazon, which are just the everyday kind of, utility. Everyday yep. utility, the biggest you can get anything you want at any of those places. So, I th but I, I think that, uh, and this is one of the things that I, I'm sure every loyalty program struggles with: the more uh, everyday utility there is that you provide, the more commoditized your offering is. Right. Mm -hmm. So, part of the, the the logic underneath the push to experiences. Uh, and you know, once in a lifetime memories. Uh, part of the reason that, that we're heading in that direction is because that's non-comparable, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's differentiated, because it's something you can only find with, with us and it's not, it doesn't come down to the number of dollars and cents in the offer uh, or it, you're trying to move as far away from that sort of totally fungible um, uh, you know, uh, offering that could be swapped out from provider A, provider B, provider C. Right. So that's, for us, that, yeah, that's, that's kind of like, so it's the credit you get. When you give the gift cards out right. and people use them, they see there's value in doing this, so I'm going to keep consolidating my behavior because I get value and I'm seeing it. But the part where that actually, that it moves to something where they actually feel a more emotional connection to it is if something is out of the ordinary that was unexpected. And that's kind of the balance. And of course, you can't do that at scale. You can't do it for everybody. And I can tell you there's also a lot of, I mean, we were giving, a, we give away tickets to gymnastics events and the like because we support the U.S. gymnastics team. And when you call people and say, you know, we have two tickets or four tickets for your family to go to an event on Saturday at the Verizon Center, wherever it is, they actually don't believe you. What's the catch? You're going to sell me a timeshare, right? I'm going to get in there and a video will play and we can't get out until we sell. I mean, they just, there's this... At, we gave away Olympic trips to actually to the Olympics. And, and I'm not kidding. A guy really didn't believe it until it was, he was there practically. He was just mm -hmm. waiting for something to, to not be real. But that's when it's that, it's non-comparable, the words you said. When it's that unexpected, that's where you actually get people who are committed. You know. So let me ask you a quick question on that following up then. So about a year and a half ago, Panera launched a program in the quick service restaurant industry which was fairly unique in the fact that it really didn't have a pro published program structure. It had an engagement strategy that looked something more like if you showed up in the store, you were offered to join the program fairly quickly, fairly yeah. seamlessly, but they said, oh, would you like a cookie? The third time in, they may have offered something else, but there never was a currency. There never was a published exchange quid pro quo. And uh, really the power behind this is, you know, we sometimes use the term surprise and delight, perhaps a little too much, but that's what it really was. And it was unpublished, but consistently reinforced rewards and in, at its best state, tailored with the information they had to make it incredibly personal and incredibly relevant for you. So I'm curious after 20 some odd years here, actually, I'm trying to think the exact date of honors. The honors is 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. If you had to do it over again right now, 
would you go to something more like that unpublished program structure or would you stay with the, the published program structure? I could tell you we tried. I mean, when we mm -hmm. launched our Diamond membership, we didn't publish the criteria on purpose. But, and, uh, you know, if anybody is familiar with United and 1K, 1K was not the name of a program. It was the little indicator that they put on the, the reservation form so that they could tell their people, this is a 100,000 miles traveler. So you try to do those things, and I, I think ultimately I would try, because ultimately what you are trying to find is a way to reward and mm -hmm. recognize your better customers. And if you can do that without creating an, a, a sense of expectation where you really only get credit for fulfilling against what you did, not for actually doing something special for them, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that is a better model if you can, but you also, some customers and a segment of them want to know what it is and want to know what they're going to get and want to be able to compare, and, and uh, we haven't been able to manage to figure out a way. We're still looking at that even now. We said we could add another tier to our program, and there are people that would just do whatever it took to hit it, because they love us, but they play the game so strongly, and they're, they're, we call them the games players, not Vegas context, but game players, and they, they'll do whatever it takes to, to try and get there, mm -hmm. but they're actually not the majority. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, I mean, functionally, what points structures allow you to do uh, when, you're, when you achieve any meaningful scale, and you got 30-something million, we're over 40 million uh, members of our loyalty program, what, what a point structure allows you to do is take care of every member of your program uh, in a way that's commensurate with the value they give you. Now, um, because all, the alternative is to, um, you know, only really take care of the top, you know, 5%, but then you've got folks, everybody else, sitting around waiting, you know, wondering what, what's the, the point. Um, or you end up having something that's, you know, punch card-esque, where it's like every fifth time I show up, I get the cookie offer. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that's fine, um, but it may not be satisfying or it may not make sense to your customers. And so um, while I, I would not say that a points currency is is ever going to be the differentiating thing that people talk about loving and that they would tell their friends, you got to join this program, and that's not going to be, um, it's never going to excite that kind of emotional response. Um, it is a useful um, part of any program that, that has, you know, large scale. Yeah. Also provides a very nice aspirational target for a lot of your, you know, hopefully look-alike best customers to eventually get there. Sorry, Peter, you had a comment. That's okay. I was just going to say, I liked your analogy earlier of a table stakes where it's kind of like you have to ante up and you have to at least have some minimum level of rewards and recognition. And then I, I also love the idea, and uh, we would love to do more of this at Plink. It's harder for us because we don't have a physical location, but to do the kind of surprise and delight where you go above and beyond what's promised in the, in the program. But, but I do think that, for us at least, that minimum level of points or rewards is almost required in a program like ours. Uh, but I, I do see you know, the, the well, upside. That's what you but, said, Josh. Well, you know, again, you, you, somebody gets, they're not, probably not going to say this program was all that. It was, they'll say it was, it's worthwhile. You should join it. I got the value from it. But they're not going to jump up and down. But if you put somebody in an Uber suite here that was unexpected, boy, does that make an impact. They're, you know, especially now. Now they're texting back, posting it. Look where we're staying. And I put a video up. You know, and that's actually something that, because it's the unexpected. So. You do want to be able to give everybody something and some value, and you do end up having, most of the times, having to publish something. But the stuff that actually spins the needle up is when something happens that they didn't expect, where the, the, the membership or the commitment that they've given actually has come back to them in a way they didn't expect. Right, it's a recognition, access. I mean, all the themes you were talking about in your presentation, those are the things that speak deeply to the human experiential part of your program. Following along that, do you think uh, rewards are more important or less important to your best customers? <laughs> uh, I have very strong points of view about this that are backed up by research. Uh, just wondering what I should tell my competitors. Uh, <laughs> uh, We're not listening. Yeah, right. Um, no, I mean, I, look, it, it, it's, um, we say rewards. If you're talking about the kind of the point currency uh, pieces of it, uh, those things matter less to uh, our most valuable customers. Uh, their motivation is, um, is quite different than the optimizing of the, the point balances. And they trust, we've earned it over many years probably, but they trust that uh, when they come to visit us and they, they give us their business that we're going to go far out of our way uh, to take care of them and to give them an experience that they deserve and, and maybe one uh, that they hadn't even imagined. And so. 
um, the, the mix, if you will, between a published kind of hard points benefit, uh, or even the published benefits, and then the unexpected experiential benefits um, shifts um, away from the points when you get up to the very higher, higher level. Got it. Yeah, I think a very powerful word came out of here earlier was commoditization. And, uh, you know, and we, we talk a little bit about rewards as being sometimes table stakes. In retail, we've seen also just people's reactions to the amount, the quantity changed dramatically. And uh, it could be fueled by things such as Groupon, where if you have a loyalty program that's 3% or 5%, you know, kind of back in the, the retail environment, and then there's the Groupon offers coming out of 50% off, it's hard sometimes to make that sound really exciting, you know, when you've got a number that's one-tenth of some of the other promotional. I was curious, have you seen uh, any effect or any kind of reaction from your members or kind of your constituents on uh, greater expectations for what that dollar amount is in terms of rewards, or are you finding the blend of experiential kind of offsetting that? I'd say Jeff, start with you. Well, I think we think and hope that it's going to offset. I, I, I think that over time you, we will see if that changes, the dynamic changes more so. Because mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing, your customers that are loyal to you don't want to feel like they're taking advantage and that, that some sort of uh, a Groupon environment or something equivalent that anyone could get is, is going to be more meaningful or powerful. And uh, one of the things that I think that we're challenged with doing is how to find the right ways to take those kind of, in our business, distressed inventory stuff that you want to sell or you'd be willing to sell at a lower price and figuring out a way to make that more directly available to our better customers themselves, right? Mm -hmm. so. If we're willing to make it an offer like that available through a Groupon, why don't we take the power that we have with the relationships we have and make them available directly to the consumers themselves? Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, you got a bean counter saying, are you diluting the revenue we would already get? So you have to find the ways to do that in, in, a, in a way that you're not hurting your business overall and becoming a discounter. And that is the commoditization process where that's all they're choosing upon. Mm -hmm. I think it's incumbent upon us all to have more to the relationship than the price. Otherwise, that is the, the trap. You, if that's all that people are going to compare on, then we can all go home. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Uh, Peter, one comment, just kind of a quick question or comment, uh, obviously representing an industry-wide uh, offering here and such. Um, you know, there's been, obviously, as you look across the globe, there's been more uh, efforts towards uh, cooperative types of solutions, loyalties. I think even you know, Scott Tissue recently launched a values-based uh, coalition where they kind of are, are really positioning themselves as an advocate for values and bringing like-minded companies. Plink represents you know, kind of a platform, obviously, that multiple players can work together. Are we going to see more of this kind of cooperative uh, type approach towards work, rewards and incentives? Uh, I would think so. I mean, it makes sense that uh, as an industry grows, you always get a little more uh, consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think an example of that, if you look at the daily deal space, I mean, there used to be hundreds of those guys, and 90% of them are probably gone now, and even the ones that are remaining are kind of struggling to show value. And it's interesting, we were talking about that earlier, but we actually, we went out and pitched ourselves from the very beginning as the anti-Groupon, so that we're, we're getting our customers to pay full price, we give them a reward on the back end, we're, we're teaching them not to wait until you get 70% off. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're a big believer in, uh, uh, rewarding people for paying full price, uh, giving them value for that. Uh, but I think that that industry is an example of kind of what will happen to the this offer space, which is kind of a newer space than the daily deal space. Uh, and it's it's getting bigger and bigger. But I think it does make sense that a consumer is only going to be a member of so many programs. Mm -hmm. So eventually the ones that aren't as big or don't have as many partners in the coalition, you know, you're, you're going to see them be absorbed or start to disappear, I think. Back to the green stamps. Right. I mean, I really do think, I mean, ultimate, it's what do the consumers want? What do the customers themselves want? And they would, in some instances, they'd like that utility to be expanded. And so if you can find a meaningful way to align some folks in a cooperative, you're going to get more, and, you know, you, so you see that in the, in the, in the cards, right? So the American Expresses and the city banks and the like, they have that as the payment vehicle, but that hasn't really extended to the experience. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me at all to see a few vertical alignments uh, across, you know, a spectrum of, of industries where people had a common currency and then some overlays and the recognition and, and surprise and delight that we're talking about here as part of that, you know, premise. Yeah, it, it, that's actually something that we already work on uh, today and we have a very deep partnership with uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines 
right? Uh, so, uh, and that's going back a few years now, but um, given that we aren't just in one space, right? We, we do have a hospitality part of our business, uh, dining and nightclubs and retail and spa and golf and skiing. And so we've got all of these different forms of entertainment uh, that people come to us seeking. And so it, it makes it um, <clears throat> a bit more challenging to integrate them all under total rewards, but we, I think we do that fairly well. But partners uh, can very naturally extend what we're able to offer. And so finding a handful of offerings through our partners that it's beneficial not only to our customers, but reciprocally we can offer something of value to their customers. Those kinds of alliances are very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that you do it in sort of by the dozen. You do it you know, in a, in a couple of strategic uh, places. Yeah, I think that uh, generally, you know, more I think about that, that is what occurs today in these partnerships and sponsorships that are more loosely aligned. Is a question as to whether or not they'll become more formally so in the future, but it wouldn't surprise me. Right, right. We, that we do that effectively today without that formal alignment. That's true, and but uh, one of the things that's so special about you know our Norwegian Cruise Line um, uh, um, partnership is um, the access that our customers have, and then the on-ship experiences that correspond to the tier that they've earned. And you know, so it's those that's sort of the next level beyond the uh, sort of value exchange which is a bit more transactional. There's the experiential piece. And if you can find partnerships where you can have not only the, the transactional piece, but also the experiential, that's, I think, a, a, a partnership that makes really good sense. Yeah, very good. So what innovations in kind of uh, incentives and rewards are kind of exciting you at this point? Does it uh, have to do with GPS? Does it have to do with some of the NFC technology? Uh, what are some of the things that are having you looking, you know, a little bit five, ten years down the road and getting really excited about the potential capabilities? Uh, so, so we pay a lot of attention to the, the, mo the mobile wallet space because uh, we do think that uh, as p people, technology is kind of changing how people are allowing their purchases to be tracked via credit card. So there's more and more of these programs now. I think mobile wallet's going to centralize that even more. If everything is not even tracked through six different credit cards, but you have one phone, one phone number, every single thing you do is tracked through that, I think it's gonna, you're gonna expect to get rewards even, even more uh, than, than, than you do now. So I, I do think, and so we watch that, we talk to the guys at you know, PayPal and Google and Square and ISIS and MCX, et cetera. You know, there's, there's in, interesting enough, we just heard at a conference, there's 400 mobile wallets out there right now and they're all fighting it out, they're duking it out to be like the one that's gonna emerge. Uh, so we watch that very closely, and for us, a, a future partnership with one of those biggest players is probably what's going to kind of l l take us to the next level. So for me, it's, it's mobile wallet. I'm having all of the same conversations you're having. Uh, I, I agree, those are, uh, that is a very exciting piece, uh, mostly because it helps you understand in a much richer way who your customers are and what they care most about. Um, for me, I, I, the answer I was going to provide before you. Uh, Sorry, I stole that. I, that's okay. No, it's a, well. The, I was going to give a different answer, but I, I agree that that's a pretty uh, exciting area that helps you just understand your customers' preferences. But for us, it's uh, it's the uh, integration of the data coming through all of the disparate POS systems we have, and because we operate in you know more than a half a dozen different verticals, um, being able to make. Uh, near time or real near time use of the data that you see coming through any of those systems tied back to historical data that you already know about the customer and then delivered through a real time channel whether that's mobile or a, a host that we can deploy to, to meet the person because we know where they are uh, mm -hmm. or whether it's just an email offer that we get out to folks those those developments and that technology um, are very exciting to us and we're, we're uh, looking into them quite uh, keen, with keen interest I guess the great part is about the most exciting is that we can do all ball. And I think there's so many th things like you're describing on the technological side that are interesting. I think for me, the, when I hear the question, my first reaction is just the paradigm shift of control. Mm -hmm. The control moving to the consumers. And that, if you play that out, how that's going to manifest itself across a whole variety of things. The power of consumerism is going to be much greater. You know, we're deciding what our next hotel or brand looks like. The customers are going to have so much greater voice in that. And, and I, th I think it was brought home to me. We were having a partnership cooperative discussion with uh, Coca-Cola. And they were talking about their loyalty program, My Coke Rewards. And they had, at the time, like 17 million members of their rewards program. But they had a 
community on Facebook of 50 million folks that liked and were posting and engaging and talking about their product, policing experiences, sharing things. And I think when I think about how the innovation that's going to come, mm -hmm. I was at a sports panel and I was talking with Dana of the UFC on one side and Gary of the uh, NHL on the other side. And Gary was saying, we don't let our guys post and tweet and we're trying to control the environment and the experience because we don't want people gambling, we don't want injury reports. He had all these reasons about how they were trying to retain control. I'm not trying to <laughs> pick on him. And over here was Dana is like, man, we pay our guys to tweet. We, our customers want to see the backside, the inside story about our sport and we want to get them engaged and feel like they're there and participating. And one sport's well off on hiatus forever, potentially now, and the other one is growing as fast as can be. And I think that that's the shift that's occurring just broadly in society and the way we think about voting and elections or what companies are doing. There's so much more power that consumers, when they start exercising that power, it's going to make all of our lives really interesting. And I think that there's going to be innovation around that that says, how do we respond and tap into that, leverage it, or or not get run over by it. Well, give people a give people a microphone, right? I mean, yeah. it, right? It, it's uh, I think that when you can cultivate that kind of of advocacy and loyalty and excitement, um, giving people a platform to share their views is an extraordinarily powerful thing, and they they will have so much more credibility than any of us will behind the scenes. Yep, mm -hmm. it's an incredibly liberating uh, moment when you realize you won't be able to control it, and then it's just really how do you kind of react and how are you actually doing you know, what you're true to and what your brand essence is. Um, you know, we're just about out of time here. I thought, uh, just check with Terrapin, do we have chance for one or two questions from the audience? Absolutely, okay, so. And keep in mind, we cannot see you at all. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Jen McMillan, I work for GameStop. So you are all loyalty experts in some respect. So step out of your daily role and tell me what is your favorite loyalty program that personally benefits you the most and why? Mine is Citibank's uh, Thank You Rewards. I have a great, apologies to American Express. We have a great partnership with Citibank and American Express. But the reason theirs works out great for me is that I have access to all these premium events. And uh, I have the luxury of being in the means and a place in my life where I could generally afford to do whatever I want to do. But it's a real hassle for me to try and figure out, oh, my daughter really likes this band and how can I get tickets to them? And that actually having access to them, just pretty much anything I want to do, I can make a phone call or send an email and they can make it happen. And sometimes I have to pay and sometimes I can use points or whatever. But it's just actually having that service has been hugely empowering for me in terms of saying, you know, I have my everyday routines. But when I want to do something that's outside the routine, I, I have another arm that just makes it happen for me, and I found that to be powerful for me personally. I have a similar answer, but uh, American Express is my is my answer for similar reasons. Uh, <laughs> Citibank, Citibank, unfortunately, uh, lost my business as a New Yorker, and I went across the street to Chase several years ago for uh, what I've regarded as a, a, a dumb mistake on their part. But uh, but I agree that that the having access to uh, someone who can go out of their way uh, to help me do something that I, I just don't have the time in my daily life to accomplish it and they, they'll just take care of it and it happens and that to me is worth so much more than the economics of that transaction. Oh, uh, well, I guess mine's a little cliche because it's, a, it's probably United Airlines just because I fly a lot and uh, that's the currency that I collect most frequently. Um, uh, and, the, and it is, I guess it's the, the upgrades and free flights that really make a difference in, in my life more than other programs I do. How about you, Fred? Yeah, for me it's actually, uh, I'd say it's kind of a difficult uh, question. Now, Jen, I know you want me to say I'm a gamer, hardcore, and you know, obviously <laughs> that uh, you know, your program is what appeals, but uh, I would go back to just what drives me. And uh, the fact is, I you know, we've worked you know we worked together 15 years ago, and you knew this then. I'm a born explorer, and so uh, my personal interest is travel. I've now been blessed to go to 65 different countries so far. I have done everything from climb Kilimanjaro to scuba dive. I'm not going to say your program, <laughs> but but the he fact is, it, it is a combination of like United and Hilton and the, and the travel portfolio. And it isn't just because uh, as we even though we're talking about rewards and incentives, those are great and I remember them and I track them and I'm conscious of them, 
but it's what it enables me to do at the end of the day. And it's kind of like how I live my life and what I'm able to kind of accomplish, you know, in the time that's really meaningful for me. And that's, you know, what I find is when I'm engaged, I'm using the program, I understand it, but it also has a level of fulfillment that the programs just really resonate the strongest and why I love doing what we all do here. I, I would add too, though, I think GameStop's actually a pretty interesting uh, loyalty program, I believe, and to tell me if this is wrong, but I think you have 10 million people that pay $15 each to be in the program, yes. which is pretty amazing. I think most people would kill, a, that. kill to have <laughs> that many people, but to have them pay yeah. to, I, I realize they get a magazine subscription and et cetera, but still, that's just, it's, it's an interesting uh, question from someone who runs a program like that. So. Yes. Power up. <laughs> Any other quick questions? Oh, back in the right. Hello, and thanks again for your presentation. Just wanted to get your thoughts about uh, if whether you were to weigh the different ways to accrue, uh, you know, points or number of transactions, for example, on a very fundamental basis that will probably lead the consumer to behave uh, more in one direction rather than another. And I'm hearing a lot of time people referring to a point-based reward system as opposed to frequency-based uh, 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 type of rewards. What would your thoughts be about that? Well, I can tell you in our case, it's a very interesting thing because we get a lot of that, the profitability of our most frequent customers. You know, they're savvy, they may have a corporate accounts, they might actually spend have um, access to better rates and the like. So we get a lot of push internally from our internal stakeholders about ensuring that the reward program is rewarding the most profitable customers. But I think the construct has to be at the consumer level, the behavior that they want. So in our case, we believe that somebody actually makes a decision about where to stay. How much they spend or how many nights they stay is secondary to that they actually choose us for the stay. So we tend to give that a bit more weight because that's the inflection point that the customer makes. And so I think then we try to figure out ways to maximize that value for us in other ways. And you know, in our case, you can earn our elite level statuses by how much you spend or how many nights you stay. And we try to calibrate those in such a way where we get at some of those needs for more profitability. If somebody, you could stay with us once for three months in the Waldorf Astoria and you know, that would be a lot more valuable than staying 20 times. So we have to figure out ways to mo modulate that, but by and large, we push it towards the actual transaction, which is a stay. And for us, uh, the unit of analysis is much more granular. Um, well, we have, again, you can earn and, uh, and redeem in our program through hotel, uh, you know, dining, nightclub shows, et cetera. So for us, uh, gaming is the one that most people go to f first because it's unique to us and they haven't seen it in other places. So it's, bet it's basically based on uh, the, the bets that you make. Um, but that, that's the, the points then are earned based on those kinds of behaviors and that's what I referred to earlier as the 10%. The other 90%, and I, my numbers aren't <laughs> precise, but uh, the other 90% uh, are based on uh, theoretical profitability. And I say theoretical profitability because uh, we, we control for the chance of luck. Uh, so we, we look at the, the theoretical profitability of certain kinds of behaviors. So uh, we do it based on profitability rather than revenue and rather than on frequency. Yeah, just add that there's definitely some industries out there where frequency uh, makes a lot of sense. You know, we've done different analyses, say, in the QSR industry where we've seen the elasticity of frequency actually from promotional dollars invested. Uh, pays out favorably compared to even trying to swell the check size. Uh, and some of that makes intuitive sense. You know, if somebody's going for lunch, there's a limit to how much they can eat for lunch. But uh, getting into the consideration set and building that frequency, if the brand message is there, if the product's there, if the experience is there, the loyalty program can absolutely reinforce that. So that's a great question. So speaking of rewards and incentives, I believe ours is probably waiting outside, and that is cocktail hour. So gentlemen, thank you very much for joining today. And everyone out there, thank you very much. Thank you.